on the last days. However, dispensationalists believe, and I believe they, they're correct, that they correspond to somewhat overlapping but basically consecutive periods of church history. The first Ephesus, the Ephesian age, corresponding to the first century apostolic church, the church of uh, Smyrna, the persecuted church, Pergamum, the patristic church, Thyatira, the church of the Middle Ages, Sardis, the church of the Reformation, Philadelphia is, of course, uh, the, the revivalist and the mission churches, and then the last one is Laodicea. With this in view, look with me, please, to Revelation chapter 3, the message to the church of Laodicea, commencing in the 14th verse. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. You do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. I sob to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and correct. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now the metaphor for nakedness here speaks of gymnazo in Greek, but it's the Hebrew concept of not having the garments of salvation. There's people in this church who are never really truly saved. Laodicea is a name of a church, and we have to understand about these seven churches. Some aspect of the way the Lord Jesus appeared in the first chapter of Revelation is highlighted in his message to each church. Some aspect of the way he appeared is highlighted in his message to each church. But additionally, the Greek names of these churches indicate something about their character. The Greek names indicate something about their character. Laodicea is a compound term, it's one word, but it's a compound term, from Laodicea. Leo de Kmi. Is there a way to get these front lights out so the people can see this better, perhaps for the filming? Leo de Kmi, people's opinions. It could also be translated people's rights. I had the right to my opinion. That is the way the last church will be. The seventh church, the final church before Jesus comes, before the events leading up to the Great Tribulation happen, will be a church run by people's opinions. We have multiple references to Laodicea in the Old Testament. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. The Antichrist will destroy many while they were at ease. Laodicea's first problem is it doesn't know it's Laodicea. By sob to anoint your eyes that you may see. They are blind to their true spiritual state. Some of them don't even have the garments of salvation. Laodicea doesn't know that's who it is. Quite a situation. Part of the reason is not just that they're lazy, but they have lost their zeal, their enthusiasm, their first love, but that they judge by the world's standards. They make the world's standards the barometer of blessing. The world puts a price tag on everything. Because you're prospering financially or materially, therefore that becomes the indicator of God's blessing in their thinking. This is exactly what we see with the tele-evangelists who've made born again a household joke by discrediting and undermining the gospel. They use the world's standards to judge. That becomes their barometer, money. We must be all right. God's blessing us materially. In fact, when we read the seven churches, it was poor and struggling churches, persecuted churches like Smyrna and churches like Philadelphia who were spiritually rich. They judge by the world's standards. It is not the material affluence itself that's the problem. It's their attitude towards it. They don't know they are Laodicea. People's opinions, people's views permeate the church in the last days. They lose their biblical basis or their biblical focus in determining what the church should be and what its ministry should be. It becomes a church run on the ideas of men. Leo de Keomai. And they think they have their right to this. 
We have to understand something about worldviews. I'd like to introduce you to two concepts. One is recontextualize, and the other is redefine. Recontextualize or redefine. Whenever you have a change in worldview, or when you bring the gospel into a new culture to where the gospel is alien, you have a challenge. How do you communicate those truths to people who don't have your worldview? They see things differently. When the Wycliffe translators went to a certain place in tribal Africa, in equatorial Africa, to a certain tribe who had no concept of snow, didn't know what it was, they never saw it, they translated Isaiah 118 Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as coconut. They simply recontextualized the meaning until the people were able to understand what snow was. Then they changed it to snow eventually. But they wanted people to understand how Jesus makes us white and so forth, and they didn't know what snow was, so they had a problem. There's always a problem when the worldview changes when you go to another worldview. Biblically, we're supposed to do what St. Paul did when he took the gospel to the Greeks and Romans, to the Greco-Roman world. He recontextualized. In other words, he changed the package, not what was in it. He changed the packaging, not what was in it. When he debated the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers on Mars Hill in the Areopagus in Acts chapter 17, he took a concept that would have been known only to Jews at that point a Jewish gospel of a Jewish Messiah, and now he's explaining it to Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in the Areopagus, the Areopagites. He didn't change the meaning, however. He simply took the gospel and he recontextualized it. He presented it in a context that Greeks could understand it. This is recontextualization. Purely biblical. The problem becomes when instead of recontextualizing the gospel, people redefine it. They change its meaning. This will always happen when there's a change in worldview. You can always argue what came first, the chicken or the egg. So arbitrarily, just for the sake of brevity, let's say you had a change in science. A change in science will cause a change in technology. Change in technology will cause a change in economy. Economic change will cause social and cultural change. Then there'll be a political change. Political changes. You'll wind up with a new worldview. Well, let's see how this could happen. Long before Luther, long before Calvin, long before Zwingli, long before the Reformation, long before the Reformers were born, there were always true born-again Christians. People in the Western world, particularly places where you have a lot of Lutherans, like the Dakotas, have this misconception that the Reformers rediscovered the Gospel. In actual fact, there were people who never lost it. There were the Waldensians. In England, there were the Lollards following John Wycliffe. In Central Europe, there were the Bohemian Brethren following John Huss long before Luther. But you had the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy nor Roman. And the Pope always had the political leverage to stop the spread of the gospel by persecuting these people. They controlled all education, all everything. The only Bibles were essentially Latin Vulgates, manuscripts copied by monks, and even many of the clergy, particularly the mendicants, couldn't even read it themselves. People had no concept. But something happened. Something happens. After the Renaissance, there's a change in science. Galileo comes along, Copernicus comes along, Kepler comes along, and there's a change in technology. What happens? Well, the astrolobe is invented. Magellan and Francis Drake circumvent the globe, circumnavigate the globe. and. Uh, the printing press is invented by Gutenberg. So Tyndale puts the Bible into English, Luther puts it into German, and now it can be mass-produced. 
The Pope can no longer stop the spread of the gospel because there's cultural change, political change. What happens? Nationalism is born. Feudalism collapses. Capitalism is born in Europe. And people begin saying, I'm Scottish. I'm German. I'm French. I'm Swiss. Now the Pope no longer had the control of the Western world the way he once did. Then your identity as a citizen of the Holy Roman Empire was basically being a Roman Catholic. You had loyalty to a regional power who was usually a noble, and there was a loyalty to the church, and that was it. The emperor was essentially there, but it was all a confederation. That changes in the 16th century. So people like Luther come along, following somebody called Erasmus of Rotterdam, and Luther and others like him simply got away with things other people were always killed for. <laughs> Huss said the same things long before Luther. They accused Luther of agreeing with Huss, and he said, I do. When he gave his Here I Stand speech in his confrontation with John Eck, Here I Stand. Luther began, bad, uh, began right, ended badly, but began right. Well, Luther understood that he didn't rediscover the gospel. He knew there was people who never lost it. But now things change. Now the gospel is able to spread. That's an example of how it works. Right now, we've reached a time in history where the same thing has happened. The same as Western civilization went from an agricultural economy to a manufacturing economy, okay. from a feudalistic economy to a capitalistic one, now the Western world has gone from an industrial manufacturing economy to a high-tech one to a service-based economy. We're now post-communist, post-capitalist. It is a new economy, a new worldview. And once more, the challenge is there. How do we present the gospel to this new worldview? This new world can be understood as being post-modern. Post-modern. Let's understand how this works. The first major time this ever happened was with the ministry of Paul. Paul the Apostle. He goes to the Greco-Roman world with the Gospel. Paul recontextualizes. He takes the same Gospel, doesn't change the meaning, he simply culturally represents it to people in a language and in a cultural framework they could understand. Paul does this. That's the first century. By the time we get to the fourth century, it changes. With political motives, Constantine pseudo-Christianizes the Roman Empire. Something goes wrong. The Church Fathers, the patristic writers, particularly the post-Nicene ones, but it even begins before that. People like Cyprian of Carthage, Ambrose of Milan, they all influence somebody called Augustine of Hippo. Well, now it's the religion of the state. Christianity has to be redefined. So Augustine, he takes a, another approach than Paul took. Paul Platonizes Christian, uh, Augustine of Hippo Platonizes Christianity. He turns it into a Platonic religion. He rewrites it in terms of Plato's philosophies. A lot of people think he was a great guy because he stood up against a heretic called Pelagius. He did, but he did a lot of bad things. And tragically, both Protestantism and Catholicism come from Augustine. They don't directly come from the New Testament. Well, Augustine got it wrong. He Platonized the church. When he had the New World view, he simply rewrote Christianity as a Platonic religion. People thought they had to study Plato to understand the Bible. Happens again. The Renaissance, an Aristotelian worldview comes along and displaces a Platonic worldview, people following Aristotle. It begins in the Muslim world. When Europe was in the Dark Ages, Islam was having its Golden Age. I'm not here to offend anybody, but to state facts. If you want to know what a Roman Catholic world would look like, look at what a Roman Catholic world was like. 
If you want to know what the Roman Catholic Church would do in the world if it had its way, look what it did do. It had its way for 1,200 years and gave us the Dark Ages. That was the Roman Catholic world, the Dark Ages. It begins to end with the Renaissance, but then somebody comes along named Rambam, Maimonides, and he rewrites Judaism as an Aristotelian religion. He writes a book called Guide for the Perplexed, and Judaism becomes redefined in terms of Aristotle's philosophy. So Christendom has to get its one, and it gets somebody called Thomas Aquinas. He was an Aristotelian philosopher. The whole idea of transubstantiation comes from Aristotle's philosophy of accidents, completely debunked by modern science. For instance, in the pre-Enlightenment world, they didn't make a distinction between science and the occult. With the Enlightenment, they began to change. Astronomy went one way, astrology went another way. But in the ancient world, they were the same. Okay? In the post-Enlightenment world, chemistry and physics went one way, alchemy and magic went the other way. <laughs> but to them, it was all alchemy. Medical science and pharmacology went one way, healing arts went the other way. There was a split between science and the occult. Now, one of the things you're seeing happening now in the postmodern world is a rapprochement between science and the occult. I've been warning about this for more than 15 years, maybe 18 years. You're particularly seeing it in holistic medicine, particle physics, and computer videographic sciences. You're seeing a rapprochement between science and the occult. That's another issue I only mentioned it in passing. When they saw a chemical reaction, they didn't understand it. They thought it was magic. They didn't know about atomic covalency or about electrons shifting between shells or orbitals. They didn't know anything about ionization. They didn't know about chemical change. So they had the philosophy of accidents. Something could look like one thing but be another. <laughs> That's how they explained these chemical reactions they couldn't understand. Well, we put it, it looks like salt, it tastes like salt, but we really know it's so, sodium and chlorine. It writes like a pen, looks like a pen, but actually it's a cigar. Give me a light. Or it looks like a microphone, it works like a microphone, but it's a lollipop. <laughs> Tutti frutti, you want some? It looks like bread and wine. It tastes like bread and wine, but actually it's the protoplasm of Jesus Christ. <laughs> now today, Roman Catholics will tell you we accept it by faith. They didn't accept it by faith when they invented it. They thought that's what it was chemically, you understand? Well, what does he do? He redefines Christianity as an Aristotelian religion. And in the Catholic Church, the religious orders who followed Plato were always fighting the ones who followed Augustine. The Dominicans and the Franciscans particularly hated each other. Then the, after the Reformation, the Jesuits took over. They were always against each other. But with the Reformation, it changes again. It really changes. The Reformers, you'd have to put them somewhat in the middle. They got some things right, some things wrong. But the real change begins to come to the modern world with the Industrial Revolution, begins in England in the 18th century. Christianity is a dead middle class institution, characterized by sweatshops, child labor, and gross social injustice. In England, children as young as four were digging 16 to 18 hours a day in coal mines, dying of black lung disease and God knows what else. They were completely alienated from Christianity. Sweatshops, the only respite the working classes of England had were getting drunk in uh, gin mills, cheap p bars, pubs, <coughs> these gin mills, and they would sing two-part vocal harmonies. That was their respite from the world in which they lived. Well, along comes John Wesley, George Whitfield. They begin to recontextualize the gospel for the working classes. His brother, Charles Wesley, begins taking these two-part vocal harmonies that 
that was singing in the gin mills and puts Christian words to them. Same ideas. And can it be that I should you know, Oh, for a thousand tons. They got these things straight out of the pub. There's the whole kind of controversy you have now about Christian rock happened back then with these gin songs. Wesley got it right. Not perfect. But John Wesley got it right. Whitfield got it right. They understood how to take the gospel and recontextualize it. Not change its meaning, just make it understandable to people who had a different way of looking at their world. But now we're at another juncture in church history. Post-industrial, postmodern, high-tech, consumer-based economy that's actually both post-capitalist and post-communist. There's a new world. What is this new world like, and how do we communicate the gospel to people with this new worldview? University campuses, particularly people under the age of 40 years old. How do you communicate the gospel to them? I've seen people try to stop the decline of Christendom in the Western world with all kinds of things, usually hype artistry or programs, mega churches, do anything you need to get people in. Now understand, the last time there was a revival in the United States, or in the Western world, the last time there was a revival was the Jesus movement in the late 60s, early 70s, the hippies. People like myself of my generation, we did not find love and peace and things like this and taking psychedelic drugs or substance abuse or what we called free love. All we found was drug abuse and venereal disease and the rest of it. People ripping each other, up on, ripping each other off in drug deals. But there was a move of God among the hippies. Established churches didn't like the hippies. There were other people like Chuck Smith or Marsh Rosen, the founder of Jews for Jesus, who actually reached out to the hippies. That was the Jesus movement. But you see, we brought our worldview with us. We drove Lyndon Johnson out of the White House. We drove Nixon out of the White House. We went down south and we made them let black people ride the bus and vote. <laughs> it was a different world then. Black guys coming back from Vietnam uh, and they couldn't go to university in Alabama. <laughs> we had the numbers, we had the youth, we can change it. So therefore, we can take this into the church and transform society. That was the thinking. The megachurches came from this thinking initially. Now the first megachurches, like Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, they were all right because they did not redefine the gospel, they recontextualized it. In more recent years, the megachurches have gone away from recontextualizing the gospel and they're redefining it based on ideas of marketing, the purpose-driven lie, secular psychology, let us understand what is happening. If the new world view is anything, the new world is instamatic, instamatic, digital photographs. It used to be, it took six weeks for a letter to reach your cousin in Western Australia. Then airmail came, took six days. Then email came, take six seconds. We want it yesterday. Instant coffee, instant communication, instant Christianity. Just get on an airplane and go to Toronto, Canada, or Lakeland, Florida, and have some tattooed goon lay hands on you and kick your grandmother in the face, and you'll be blessed and you'll have a move on. Just get deliverance. You got a problem with sin? Don't worry about picking up your cross and following Jesus. Don't worry about discipleship. Just bind that spirit in the name of Jesus. Now the term deliverance is not even used in the Bible in that sense. Bearing in mind I myself am a moderate Pentecostal. Do what I do. Not one time, not one place in the Bible, not even once, is a demon ever cast out of a born-again Christian. Christians can be demonically oppressed, but when there's an oppression, the Greek word is therapeo, healed. When there's possession, it's ekbalo, cast out. Why did the apostles never teach this? 
Why is there no New Testament basis for casting demons out of people who profess faith in Christ? Yes, Christians can be demonically oppressed. Paul was. But possessed? What I do when I see a church with a deliverance service is I go home and call them up. Good evening. Do you have a deliverance service this evening? Yes. Send over two cheeseburgers and raw onions. Don't forget the coleslaw. This is instamatic Christianity. You're not going to get spiritual by an airline ticket to Toronto, Canada to have some heretic lay hands on you. Who's getting the demons cast out this week? The same ones getting the demon cast out last week. Who's getting in line to be slain in the spirit, quote unquote, this week? The same one as last week. Weren't you just up here? Yeah, now I have a headache. <laughs> this is a lot of garbage. It's not biblical. That's not even what biblical slain in the spirit means. That's not how it happens scripturally. When you see it happening in the ministries of people like John Wesley and George Whitfield, it was unsaved people falling under the power of God and repenting of their sin. It wasn't Christians acting like jerks. Most of what you see today is hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception. That's all it is. Instamatic worldview? We want an instamatic Christianity. The new worldviews, Andy Warhol said, everybody's going to be famous for 15 minutes. We live in a media driven society. The electronic church. That becomes where people get their doctrine. That becomes where they pay their tithes and offerings to a con artist televangelist. To some woman who's raising more money for earrings and another facelift. She needs it. The first one didn't work. It becomes a show. It all becomes a media event. Their conferences are media events. Their TV programs are media events. It becomes so gaudy, the world makes fun of it. Believe me, the world is always going to have better rock concerts. We are called to bring the gospel into the world. We are not called to bring the world into the gospel. But Laodicea, they've got their own ideas. It's people's opinions. Instead of recontextualizing, they are redefining. If the new world is anything, it is psychologized. Now understand something. God breathed on Adam, he became a living soul. Animals have soul, but it's not immortal. They have consciousness, but no spirit. God breathed on Adam. He became a living soul, the Hebrew word Ruach. What humans made in the image and likeness of God, people, imagio dei beings, what we are, psychologically, our consciousness, our intellect, our emotion, our minds, is a composite, a homogeneous composite of what we are organically and what we are spiritually. Mental illness never originates in the mind. When somebody doesn't play with a full deck, there's either something wrong with them chemically, or there's something wrong with them spiritually, or both. Psychology is a pseudoscience. It is non-quantitative. We can speak of neuropsychology, biopsychology, psychiatric medicine, but psychology, Jungian, the Freudian with the collective unconscious is a cult. Freudian psychology comes from his own perversions. Abraham Maslow, these people are pseudoscientific frauds. I'll tell you what a psychologist is. Somebody who wasn't good enough at biochemistry to go to medical school and be a shrink. It becomes the humanism of man. It's the humanistic religion. That's what it is. The school system is psychologized. Media psychologized. The advertising industry is completely psychologized. It gets into the church. The church has become psychologized. If you work for a corporation, you would have been sent at some point to a sales motivational seminar. And there would have been some slick dude coming out with an expensive suit and a Benny Hinn haircut. And he'd pick up a microphone, go into a little routine. Visualize your goal. 
Make it a reality in your mind. Minimize the negative, maximize the positive. Once you make it a reality in your own mind, you'll be able to make it a reality in the mind of others. You'll get those investors. You'll get that investment capital. You'll get those shareholders. You'll get that venture capital. But it begins in your mind. Every time the Dow goes through the basement, they find out the only person that worked for is the motivational speaker. <laughs> but now look, it's into the church. God has given me a vision, hallelujah, for a church that's going to see 10,000 people. Don't tell me about the unemployment in our community, how many single mothers we have on welfare in our church. I'm not interested. That's negative. I rebuke that negativity in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. What is this? Psycho babble. The purpose driven lie is based on the motivational psychology, the marketing psychology of Peter Drucker, the late Peter Drucker, who died unsaved. Bill Gothard psychologized the youth of Christian America, or tried to. Dangerous man. Self-esteem. Self-esteem? <laughs> if you're the only person who ever sinned, you're not. Or if I was the only person who ever sinned, then I'm not. But even if we were, we're not, but even if we were, God would have had to become a man and go to the cross just for us personally. If that's the value God puts on each and every one of us, Jesus didn't just die for all of us, he died for each of us. If that's the value that God of the universe puts on us, what's the self-esteem thing? The Bible doesn't teach self-esteem, it teaches diminution of self. James Dobson psychologized the women of Christian America. Influenced by his mentor, the 33rd degree Mason, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, his protege, Robert Schuller, comes along and psychologizes the pastors of Christian America. Promise keepers attempted to psychologize the men of Christian America, but it's all psychology. What is purpose driven based on? Peter Drucker, motivational psychology, sales psychology, marketing psychology. The world is psychologized. Now, how do you recontextualize the gospel? For a psychologized worldview? Valid question. But instead of recontextualizing it, they are redefining Christianity as a psychological religion, the feel good factor. Feeling has nothing to do with anything. The new worldview. Multi faith. Multicultural society. Hence, Rick Warren says he can work with Hindus, he can work with Jews, he can work with Muslims. And they're all going to hell. There's only one gospel. God becomes a man to take our sin, to give us his righteousness. We're saved by repentance. Saved by grace through faith. We're saved by regeneration, by being born again, by conviction of the Holy Spirit. That is the biblical gospel. We're not saved by sacraments. We're not saved by an ex opere operato ritual. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by atoning for our own sin in purgatory. Does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin? Or do you atone for your own in purgatory? Well, if you ask Chuck Colson, he says, you can be a Catholic and believe a different gospel. How many people here used to be Catholic before you were saved? Put your hand up. See these dear people? If you want to know what Roman Catholicism is, do not listen to a deceiver like Chuck Colson. Listen to the Word of God. If an angel comes with another gospel, he is accursed. Anathanizo. No, the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. You do not atone in purgatory for your own. That man used to be a deceiver for the Nixon White House. Now he's a deceiver for the Vatican. I'll debate him anytime, anywhere, as long as it's in front of a camera. The whole ecumenical agenda is a lie. Oh, all religions are the same. They all lead the same place. That is true. Hell. 
No religion can save anybody. Only Jesus can. Satan gets more people to hell with religion than he does all the immorality, all the substance abuse, all the gambling, etc. put together. Let's understand what's happening in the new worldview. The new worldview. Well, if the new world is anything, it is experiential. It works for me. It's all subjectivist. People don't care about objective truth anymore. It's all subjective. Experiential worldview, they want an experiential church. Now, don't get me wrong. I myself believe in the gifts of the Spirit, including the charismatic gifts understood and practiced biblically. Cessationism is not a biblical doctrine. But most of what you see today is not biblical charismata. Most of what we see today is unbiblical charismania. I saw people in Toronto, Canada. I know it was God. I couldn't control it. It must have been the Lord. I know it was God. I just couldn't stop shaking. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit is ikrete in Greek. Self-control. We're told that twice in the New Testament. If somebody is not in control of themselves, God's not in control of them. If an alcoholic gets saved, then he goes back out and begins hitting the bottle again getting drunk, coming home, abusing his family, and so forth. Is God in control of him? No. Why? Because he or she are not in control of themselves. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. By virtue of the fact they couldn't control it, biblically proves prima facie, it's not God. It can't possibly be God. It's not the Holy Spirit. At best, it's a psychological delusion, possibly even something demonic. Experiential. And you're seeing this. It works for me. I feel blessed. You weren't blessed, you were deceived. Teenage girl comes from an abusive family situation. Say her old man left, left her and her mother, whatever. Never had a father figure. Her mother maybe is a substance abuser. So the kid runs away, goes to the big city, Chicago or something like that. She meets a guy a couple of years older, he's more streetwise, <laughs> seduces her. She felt loved by an older male. She wasn't loved, she was seduced. He didn't love her, he loved him. I love me, I want you. Love is a commitment. It was pure eros. There was no real love in it. It's all experiential. You can feel whatever you want. Mormonism is based on the lie of experience. I've got a burning in my bosom and I testify to you. The Church of Latter-day Saints is true. Hallelujah. I've showed them absurd things in the Book of Mormon. We have an outreach every year in Manta, Utah to the Mormons. David out there leads it. And you can show them absurd things in their own literature. They can't answer the questions. They just revert to their testimony. I've got a burning in my bosom and I testify to you. The Church of Latter-day Saints is true. That's supposed to settle everything. That becomes the absolute litmus test of what's true and false, right and wrong, how they feel about it. But they're so sincere. The most sincere person I ever saw in my life was a Buddhist monk in Saigon. Poured kerosene over his head and lit a match. You're not going to find anybody more sincere about his religion than that guy. That's the new worldview. The new world is new age. Let me take you back to my wayward youth when I was an acid-dropping, dope-smoking hippie. I'm still nuts, but for different reasons. 1968, the charismatic movement, which had roots earlier in 66, but it kicked off in 1968, the charismatic movement said it was going to spiritually transform the Western world for Christ. That's what they said. The charismatic renewal. We're going to turn the nations and the churches back to Jesus. Same year, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi came to London, England. Gave a lecture, and then a series of lectures in Bangor, in the north of Wales, attended by the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and the pop icons of my generation. Lo and behold, the New Age movement was born. 
The New Age movement said it was going to spiritually transform the Western world. Well, that was 1968, 41 years later. Here we are, 41 years later, nearly half a lifetime later. Let me ask the question. Now that we're more than 40 years later, is the Western world more Christian now, or is it more New Age now? It is more New Age. The only thing that has failed more miserably, more shamefully, and more inexcusably than the charismatic movement has been its leaders. Individuals may have been saved, but saved into one. Zoos with a cross on the roof, they imagined to be a church. It didn't change the Western world. New Age is one. Ultimately, Christ prevails. But it's the right church, not the psycho one. New Age world, New Age church. Three times Eastern religion has invaded Western Christendom. Isaiah chapter 2 warns of this. My people are filled with influences from the East, Babylon. That's where all false religion comes from in the days of Nimrod and Semiramis. It has incipient inroads into Judaism with a person named Philo in Alexandria in the first century, but three times it invades Western Christendom. The first time is with the post Nicene Church Fathers. People like Basilides, Valentinus, and above all, Oregon. They bring Eastern religion into Christendom, Christendom. Spiritualizing texts out of context, they were Gnostics. They turned Christianity into a Gnostic religion. If anybody redefined Christianity in a bad way, it was absolutely the post Nicene Church Fathers. Second time was when the Crusades brought the spice trade from India through the Middle East back to Europe. And with it came the paganistic influences of Shia Islam and Hinduism. The counting prayer on beads, the Vishnu, the burning candles and before in, uh, the graven images. The flagellation rituals in convents and monasteries. This is all copied from the Shia Muslims, the Hindus. That was the second time. This is the third time New Age has come into the church. What was the Toronto deception in Canada? What was the Pensacola deception in Florida? What was the Lakeland deception? Kundalini Yoga. I can show you people saved out of Hinduism that will show you films filmed in India of Hindus doing the same thing. It's the serpent spirit. New Age visualization. There's actually crazy people in England, like Patrick Dixon, writing books, altered states of consciousness or manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Totally nuts. The celebration of discipline, Richard Foster, visualization. That comes straight from, uh, from Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, an organization designed to stop the spread of the gospel after the Reformation. It is the underlying theory of Roman Catholic education. Give us a child to the age of 70, he's ours for life, even if we molest them. That's them. Where did he get this? Eastern mysticism. The, the exercises of Ignatius Loyola, copied by Joyce Huggett, copied by Richard Foster. These things are in the church, big time. New Age world, you get a New Age church. Now understand, I'm talking about people who say they're born again. Liberal Protestants took Darwinism and redefined Christianity as higher criticism based on Darwinian presupposition. <laughs> but those are liberals. Don't, those people don't claim to be born again. Uh, I'm talking about people who say they're saved. Anti-Semitic world? The world's getting increasingly anti-Semitic. You're seeing this getting into the church. People like John Piper, the replacement theology. I'm not saying he's an anti-Semite, but he's certainly replacement theology. Replacement theology is a completely false doctrine. But let's look. What else is this new worldview like? What is it like? How do people see things in our new worldview? What does it like? Well... It's programmatic. 
Just get the right program for your software, your software program for your computer, and your hardware will do what you want it to. A programmatic worldview. Get the right sales program for your church, your sales will increase. Get with the program, instant waste loss. Just get the program and you'll lose weight. And the it's a programmatic worldview. Get the program, it'll work. So people like C. Peter Wagner from Fuller Theological Cemetery will go down to Latin America and see how the Pentecostal churches are growing and say, well, if we do what they do, it'll work in Colorado, it'll work in Illinois or in the Dakotas. Forget about it being a sovereign move of God's spirit. Forget about any biblical concept. To begin with, he's not even doing that. If you go to Latin America, what happened in the Reformation in the 16th century is now happening in Latin America in the 20th, 21st century. People are turning against Roman Catholicism. They're leaving it as a false religion. These church growth people are all into the ecumenical lie. Just look at it. Get the right program! 40 days of purpose. Just say the prayer of Jabez. Nothing wrong with the prayer Jabez prayed, but they turned it into a formula incantation. <laughs> Stuff is nuts. It just doesn't work that way. God is sovereign. There are principles like prayer, repentance, but you can't make it happen. Only God can. Only He can pour out His Spirit. There are principles, but we're not following the principles. You can't manipulate God with a program, make a revival happen, but that's what they think because that's the worldview. Just get the program. Rewrite Christianity as a programmatic religion. But of course, we live in a politically correct world. Don't offend anybody. Everything's all right. We just have to love. They have made love and truth mutually exclusive. God doesn't see it that way. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. And this I pray that your love, your agape, real love, that your love may abound more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. For God's love to abound, there must be knowledge of the scripture and discernment. Otherwise, you won't have love. You'll have a stupid, emotionally charged religious counterfeit, which people moronically imagine to be love. We just have to love. Where did Jesus or the apostles or the Hebrew prophets ever compromise truth for the sake of love? No, Jesus loved the woman at the well, therefore he told her the truth. Lady, your religion is no good. Salvation comes from the Jews. They've got the truth. We can't do that. Just read Purpose Driven. Rick Warren says, when you see a person living immorally into substance abuse, don't tell them to repent. Just tell them they need Jesus in their life. Then when he comes into their life, they'll clean him up. He's confusing justification with sanctification. Find me an evangelistic presentation in the New Testament that does not call people to repentance. Peter's charisma the day of Pentecost, the first one, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. Just get Jesus in their life. Put your hand up and ask Jesus into your heart. If somebody doesn't repent, Jesus isn't coming into their heart. When I began to follow the Lord, I was shacking up with my girlfriend across the street from the UN. I was on drugs. Took the last of my drugs and threw it out the window. 20 stories down on the First Avenue in Manhattan. Good thing the Polish ambassador had diplomatic immunity. Leader of Jews for Jesus in New York said, look, you can't shack up with that broad. You've either got to get married or get out. Repentance. No Christians don't smoke cigarettes or get drunk or take drugs. Just tell Jesus to come into your heart and he'll straighten you. If there's no repentance, he's not coming into your heart. The purpose-driven lie confuses justification with sanctification. They have to be seeker-sensitive, seeker-friendly. Why? Because we live in a politically correct world. You can't defend anybody. You can't say anything is wrong. 
You're right, I can't. But if the Word of God says it's wrong, that's not me. The agent of Satan, extraordinaire. La agent provocateur, extraordinaire. In his last book, Tony Campola, only quoting from it, this is what he says. We have the red letters and the black letters. The words of Jesus and the words of the other writers of the Bible. The red letters take precedent over the black ones, he says. No, it's all the word of God. Now let's understand something. Jesus himself in the Great Commission said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will remind you of all, not some, all I taught you. The epistles are inspired commentary. They're the word of God, but we read the rest of the Bible through the prism of the epistles. If you want to know what Leviticus means, read Hebrews. If you want to know what the gospel means, read Romans and Galatians. If you want to understand the Olivet Discourse, read Thessalonians. We read the rest of Scripture through the prism of apostolic commentary. Jesus told the apostles, I taught you, as did John the Baptist, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to remind you what I taught you, so you'll teach them what I meant. Think of the epistles as commentary, inspired commentary. That's what Jesus taught. That's what the apostles taught. They would even say, if anyone doesn't receive what I say, have nothing to do with them, in John, 1 John and so forth. Let them not be recognized. Mr. Campola disagrees. He says, well, Jesus never spoke against abortion. Therefore, the church shouldn't. It's not in the red letters, so it doesn't count. We don't interpret the red letters in light of the black ones. We interpret the black ones in light of the red ones. This man is from the devil. He is of those who Jesus warned would come in the last days. And his son is worse. His son says if he found things, his son Bart Campola, if he saw things about homosexuality in the Bible he didn't agree with, now don't get me wrong, I was a cocaine addict when I was in university. A homosexual or a lesbian sin is no worse than my sin. Would have put me, put me in the same hell if I didn't get saved. Jesus forgave me and forgive them. I'm not putting down the people. But the sin is the sin. What the drugs were to me, that, that was their sin. Oh no, you can't say that. And he says, if I found things in the Bible, which there is in Romans 1 and in Deuteronomy and so forth, that I didn't agree with, I'd either ignore it or spiritualize it away. Just pick and choose. Take the bits out of the Bible you don't agree with. We have Brian McLaren, the guru of the Emergent Church. McLaren joined Rick Warren in forwarding Dan Kimball's book, The Emergent Church. Now understand these people. Their idea of restoring Christianity is not to go back to the first century. Not to the apostolic church or the Ephesian age or the book of Acts or anything like that. Then the model is the mysticism of the dark ages. It's the Lectio Divina, it's contemplative prayer, it's burning candles and incense before graven images. It's based on experience, it's not about truth. McLaren says, declared publicly, he's calling for the church to have a five-year moratorium on debating the subject of homosexuality and same-sex marriage. We should suspend all discussion for five years. If we don't reach our conclusion in five years, we should have another five years. Then the church should decide. If Jesus Christ, if God has decided it is Adam and Eve, by what authority can the church decide it is Adam and Steve? You know what they're saying? The emergent church people are saying the church wrote the Bible the church can rewrite it. They are redefining Christianity. That is the whole purpose-driven lie. You go to a church and you find out, do your market research, find out what people want, then you give it to them. You might make converts, but you'll never make a disciple. And many of your converts will not even be really saved. You don't know you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. A lot of these people were never even saved. But then it goes on. The new world, the new world view, it's postmodern. Postmodernism. How do we evangelize a postmodern world? Well, we don't, they say. We redefine Christianity as a postmodern religion. This is the emergent church. Objective truth goes out the window. 
objective standards of morality and holiness go out the window. Absolutes are suspended. Everything becomes relative. I feel it works for me. Don't judge. Don't criticize. I'm not. That's what God says. We'll leave those bits out. We have never gotten it more wrong. This is what the new worldview is like. Now, how we evangelize the new worldview, the postmodern world, that is a crucial question. And the Bible does speak of things we should be doing, but that's another subject apart from what we're talking about now. How do you evangelize an instamatic society, a media-driven society, a psychologized society, a multi-faith, multicultural society, an experiential society, a new age society, a programmatic society, a politically correct society, a postmodern world? How do we evangelize it? That is the question. But instead of looking for a biblical answer, they're going away people's opinions. I have the right to my opinion. Laodicea, Laodicea, my people's opinions. Oh, Paul got it right. Wesley got it right. To a degree, the Reformers got it right. Augustine got it wrong. Aquinas got it wrong. The post nicene Fathers got it wrong. Rick Warren got it wrong. We are getting it wrong. We are not recontextualizing the gospel of Jesus Christ for the new worldview. We are redefining it. We are rewriting it. We're doing what Aquinas did. We're doing what the post nicene Church did. We've got it all wrong. Well, that's what Jacob Prash says. The question is, what does Jesus Christ say? Look what he says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. In verse 20. If you're like me, you use that evangelistically, and it's fine we do, but in its exegetical context, that's not primarily what it's talking about. He's knocking on the door of the church, not the hearts of the unsaved, even though it is not wrong to use it that way. I sometimes do that myself. But that's not mainly what it means. In its exegetical context, it means he's knocking on the door of the church of Laodicea. The church of people's opinions. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and sup with him, he with me. He who overcomes. Laodicea. Laodicea. They owe the KMI, the church of people's opinions, and he's knocking on the door. Hey, Leo, to see you, it's me, Jesus. You guys are getting it wrong. You're blowing the whole thing the way the church fathers did. You're blowing the whole thing the way that Augustine did. You're blowing it the way that Aquinas did. You're really getting it wrong, Leo, to see you. I understand your problem, your challenge, your dilemma. But you know, I showed Paul what to do. You know, I showed the reformers what to do. I showed them. I showed John Wesley what to do, Laodicea. And if you stop running on your opinions and open the door and let me in, I will show you. I will show you, Laodicea, how to recontextualize my gospel of salvation for your world. I can show you. You're not the first but you are going to be the last. Laodicea. It's me, Laodicea. It's Jesus. You want to let me in? Laodicea. It's Jesus. Let me in, Laodicea. Let he who has ears, let him hear. God bless. Dear friends, greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are 
expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo. What the scripture actually teaches about the rapture. The snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo. All available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.